welcome to the beginning of the 2016 Great Decision Program. My name is Michael Zhang, and I'm the person that's been sending you all these emails <laughs> about the program. I refrained from sending one out this morning, or late yesterday afternoon, uh, to notify you that we have our last speaker in place. All right, so uh, next Friday's topic, which hasn't gone out yet, it's been that topic kind of like a hanging chad. It's been there. Uh, it's Cuba and the United States. So Dr. Uh, Gabriel Marcello will be our speaker, and I'll send that out to you. But I thought I'd make that announcement because sometimes when we break, some people leave. Uh, for those who are new to the program, this program uh, is formulated from the Foreign Policy Association, which is based in New York City. And they've been doing this for 63 years. They, come, they develop the topics for the year of topics that they believe the United States needs to pay attention to. Then from there, they go out and they solicit individuals to write uh, an article, eight to 10 page article that's published in the Great Decision booklet that many of you purchased this year. And I appreciate that too. And if you haven't picked yours up, I'll have them available afterwards if you've ordered them. Just so everyone knows, I have no extras. I, had, I always order about five extras, uh, and they were gone within uh, less than an hour after I sent that email out that said that I had five extras. Uh, here in Carlisle, this is the 50th year that this program has been held in Carlisle. It originally started with the, uh, the Officers' Wives Club. It was, uh, so some of you may remember when it was called that, now it's called the Spouses Club. But it started as a way to have the spouses more informed of what's going on. So 50 years here, uh, and it's, uh, I can't say enough about how it's supported by the Army War College and by Dickinson College, because we get some of our speakers from both uh, areas. The purpose of the program is to prom promote thoughtful discussion on current foreign policy, and it's to encourage civic participation through the opinion balloting process. Whether you purchased a book or not, you can go on the Foreign Policy Association's website, which is fpa.org, and I will distribute that in an email, and they have an opinion uh, ballot that goes along with the eight topics. You can start it and complete your ballot as each uh, topic is discussed. If you have the book, it's in the back of the book, so you can uh, complete it in your book and then at the end go in and complete it electronically. It has to be done electronically. Also in the book this year for the first time, they have the opinion ballot results from 2015. So you can look at that. Um, there were someplace three uh, sh uh, clipboards that have your name on it, uh, an email address, and I use that to update. Because sometimes my fat fingers type your email address wrong and I get it back or type your name incorrectly. So if... Uh, you want to just verify that. If there's an error, just please annotate it and I will correct it. Uh, if you're new and you would like to be included on the email list, add your name and email address to that and I will add you to my email list. We have over 400 people on our email list now. These lists, I will update the list in my email, uh, yeah, email uh, contacts between sessions, I do not print off a new list every week because this comes out of my, my own personal ink, <laughs> okay? And so the list is about 24 pages and I uh, have three of them. So I have one going through the right section, if it would just stay in the right side, going through the center and going through the left. So I would appreciate that and I'll uh, collect them at the at the end. Um, if you 
desirable, still desire a book, you can order it online at fpa.org. You go on there, look for uh, the great decisions, and as those who uh, have been reading my email realize, they raised the price this year. All right. Uh, restrooms out the back, and they're to the, to the left. Now, emergency exits. Yes, there are four signs in the back, so we can go out those doors, and we can go both right and left, and there are exit doors that go outside. However, there are emergency exits in the front. On both sides, you go into a hallway, you just walk down that hallway. When you get to the end of the hallway, you turn to the left, and that will take you down to where their garage door is, their loading dock, and you can go outside there. So with that, I think I have covered all the necessary beginning information for, except for one thing, and that's to introduce our speaker. Our speaker today is Dr. Chris Bolin. He has for more than a decade, he has more than a decade experience as a foreign policy practitioner working at various senior levels of the United States government. During his active duty military career, he served in assignments in Egypt, Tunisia, and Jordan. From 1997 to 2003, he served as a foreign policy advisor and analyst on Middle Eastern and South Asian affairs for Vice Presidents Gore and Cheney. He is currently a professor of national security affairs at the United States Army War College, where he teaches graduate classes on international relations, national security affairs, American foreign policy, and Middle Eastern history and politics. He is also an adjunct professor at Gettysburg College, teaching undergraduate courses on international relations and U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East. He has a Ph.D. in international relations and a Master of Arts degree in Arab Studies from Georgetown. He is also a distinguished graduate of the United States Military Academy. Please join me in, in welcoming Dr. Bolin. Thank you. Appreciate it, Mike. Well, thank you all very much for coming. Um, I wish I had a cheerier topic to talk about than this, but I suppose that's the nature of national security challenges. Um, you'll notice, I mean, the title this was billed is The Rise of ISIS, so I kind of built that into the lecture title here. But I also want to, you know, take advantage of some of my policy background and interests and focus on, in true academic fashion, what all the problems and challenges are for U.S. policy. And then during the question and answer session, I hope you all can offer some solutions for me. We can, uh, we can pull on forward. So I do include my contact information here. I'm a genuine policy wonk. I really love talking about this, reading about it, and, and really more importantly in venues like this, honestly hearing you know, your reactions, your thoughts, your opinions, your concerns um, about these issues. So feel free, we can carry this conversation on. Um, you know, beyond this particular lecture here as well. Um, and then the last thing, of course, anything, I do say these are all my personal opinions and assessments. Um, they certainly don't reflect any official government or war college uh, thinking or perspectives. Um, I am a big picture person. I think it's, you know, you've all, I, I know like good students of these national security issues. You've thoroughly read the read ahead there that was provided in the Great Decisions Packet. Um, but I think it's worthwhile to step back and really think about what the strategic context of these events. And then, because we can, you know, spend hours updating the minutia of what's going on yesterday and today. But what I hope to do is give you a little bit broader perspective so when you leave um, here at the end of this session, you have at least a framework to really analyze what the future events, you know, are going to be. Um, what's in a name? This is the first thing to really talk about is because you see this organization, ISIS, ISIL, IS, it's referred to in different ways in different venues. Uh, some of this is just reflects the actual historical evolution of the group itself, um, but, but it's all the same organization. If, you know, this is the black flag of ISIS. If anybody reads any Arabic or have spent any time there, you recognize, I mean, it's the Shahada. It's the statement of witness um, for Muslims. It's la ilaha illallah wa Muhammad Rasulullah. There is no God but God, um, and Muhammad is the prophet of God. So that's the flag. This is the leader, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Um, the organization started out as kind of the Islamic State in Iraq. In Arabic, it's the Dawla al-Islamiyah fil-Iraq. And then it morphed 
is uh, there was chaos in Syria, it expanded into Syria, so the name changed. And in Arabic, it's a Dawla al Islamiya fil Iraq wa Asham. Asham, by some in English press, this is kind of stuck uh, with the ISIS because of the Shah sound in Asham. Um, and folks translate that as kind of, some folks mistranslate it really as Syria. Well, Asham really is a term for greater Syria or the greater Levant. So it includes, you know, parts of present day Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, and Israel. And this is how the group referred to itself with that sense of greater Syria, the Levant. And that's actually a more accurate translation. And it's the one that you see that the White House prefers. When they're talking about this group, they talk about ISIL precisely for that reason. Um, and then once the caliphate was established here, they changed the name to the, simply the Islamic State because the uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi wanted to reflect the sense that it's one, right? It's a single caliph, so it's just the Islamic State. And then lastly, you see this term thrown around, it's Daesh. And that comes from the Arabic, if you take the first sounds of each of the major um, words there, you get this Daesh, and in Arabic, it's actually very close to um, rough translation would be like trampled upon or stampeded on. So it's this very negative connotation. And it's why a lot of folks in the region actually prefer the word Daesh. And you'll see Secretary Kerry and others actually kind of use this term. But it's all referring to the same organization. Um, again, stepping back. I mean, and we'll talk just a little bit about each one of these regional factors. But I would say these are the real factors that are driving developments and events in the Middle East right now. And the, the one thing they all have in common is that the U.S. isn't capable of doing much about them, right? I mean, you've got just this weakening of the traditional authoritarian structures in the country. Um, there's not much we're going to do to actually build these um, relatively illegitimate, weakly legitimate governments in the area. We've done that for decades, successfully so, but that is changing now. Um, there's a real struggle with what is our political identity, um, what is our genuine sense of identity, and that's an internal battle that the people of the region are going to have to come up and decide on their own where their primary sense of loyalty and identity resides. Um, both of those lead to these, these issues of failed states, and the scale of the socioeconomic problems in the region are nearly insurmountable, and it's tough for an American to admit that there's you know, not a ready solution for everything, right? But uh, I'll show you some figures that are pretty scary, and it'll give you a sense of these problems are going to be persisting for a long time into the future, and, and, the, and that lack of authority and that vacuum of authority is where these groups like uh, the Islamic State actually thrive, survive, and find their home. Um, simultaneously, you have a rise of sectarianism, the Sunni-Shia split, and organizations like the Islamic State are Sunni-oriented, and they drive this sectarian division much to their advantage in the region to build further recruits um, and bring people into the region under their black flag. And then finally you have the modern information age and that's uh, facilitated a lot of things for the Islamic State. You're probably all very familiar. Um, you see a lot in the uh, media about how effective they are in terms of mobilizing social media. So theologically they may well represent a huge step backward in terms of their interpretation of Islam and how life should be lived, but that hasn't stopped them from taking full advantage of modern technology. So very briefly uh, to run through this, I mean, the Islamic Spring, um, misnamed the Islamic Spring, really started in, uh, at the end of 2010. And the speed with which it spread throughout the region was just incredible. I mean, we lost very close US allies literally within weeks of one another. We lost Ben Ali in Tunisia, then we lost Mubarak in Egypt. Then we lost President Saleh in Yemen. Then you started the uprisings in Syria that have led to the chaos we see today and the rise of ISIS. So these things spread very, very quickly through the region. Um, some, one of the good things is, I mean, you'll notice that there, who was burning American flags during these uprisings? Really no one, 
I mean, so it was not anti-US. This is really, these are really events that are driven locally. Um, and the US at least isn't the, you know, the focus of the ire or frustration in the region. The people of the region really are turning uh, and focusing that anger, resentment, and frustration to their own um, leaders. Um, it's useful to actually track how folks in the region actually uh, refer to these events. And a person I'd really recommend to you, and I'll sneak um, little subtle hints about book reviews. If you're, you know, if you're interested in reading more on this on your own, I'll uh, flash up books and titles for you so you can pursue that. Uh, but Rami Khoury is an analyst who writes in the uh, Daily Lebanon Star. He uh, writes in English, phenomenally insightful um, analyst there. And he very early on to the Arab Spring launched onto this uh, recognition that Arab Spring is a, is a Western European term that does not reflect the reality of what these events really mean to the region. Instead, they use terms like intifada, which is the same term that the Palestinians use. It's literally like shake off the repression of the occupiers, you know, in our country. Um, uh, negatively, it's also, they refer to it as thawra, single revolution, or thawra, multiple revolutions taking place throughout the region. So that gives you a sense of the scale of these uprisings. Yes. It's not, so sorry about that. I'll see what I can, maybe if I move away from the mic, that'll help a little bit. I don't know, we'll see. Um, so and then more positively, you have these other terms like awakening or um, renaissance. And uh, Marwan Muwasher was a foreign, uh, former foreign minister and prime minister in Jordan has wrote about, written about this in English. And you know, he views the challenge really as developing a more tolerant pluralistic society. So there's, you know, there's this long-term positive hope that out of this, out of these violent uh, uprisings will come a better future for the people of the region. There's also, again, just stepping back a little bit, um, people, everyone has a, you kind of have multiple senses of identity, right? And they overlap. I mean, sometimes I'm very conscious of being a um, professor when I'm lecturing here very conscious of my identity as a professor and a teacher and an educator. Um, other times I'll be in a contest when I'm waiting in line at the pharmacy and active duty folks are flushing ahead of me in line uh, for their refills. I'm very conscious of being a retired military person, right? When I'm taking communion at mass, I'm very conscious of my Catholic identity. When I'm meeting with foreign leaders, dignitaries, or students, I'm very conscious of being American. So we all have these different multiple senses of identity. And the people in the region are struggling with this. And what I've listed here is just kind of in chronological order um, what these, the major senses of identity are, the major affiliations in terms of a, you know, what really would represent a legitimate political system for us in our view. And of course, the longer the pedigree, arguably the deeper that sense of interest, right? So certainly this is what the radical Islamist groups are picking up on, is this, no, we're first and foremost Muslims. That's our primary source of identity, and any government that we form must be reflective of those values as Muslims. Um, this was the heyday of Gamal Abdel Nasser. There's still a very strong sense of, no, I'm, I'm ethnic, I'm Arab. I'm part of the Arab um, nation. We share a common language. We share a common history. And so that is an, an important source of identity. You certainly still have, along with these other sources of identity, it means something to be Egyptian. It means something to be Lebanese. It means something to be Syrian. But again, these are all relatively recent creations in terms of nation states. Most of these nations weren't formed till after World War II. So it, there's a little bit of a thin veneer of this, right? And then the thinnest veneer of all is arguably Western style democracy. And you did see, at least in the initial Arab uprisings, who were spearheading a lot of these movements. It was young Arabs who were really kind of espousing Western secular democratic traditions. So, but again, they, their voice was relatively muted, you know, as these um, uprisings continued, but it's still there. Um, and, and these things are kind of battling it out. Um, a lot of commentary talks about ISIS as kind of what a unique, new, novel organization it is. Um, it's really not. 
I mean, there's been a long history in Islam, and particularly recently since the colonial period, of, um, of a rising activist political Islam. In other words, our, again, this is a battle for a sense of identity. We are Muslims, and whatever form of government we take must reflect that sense of identity, whether it's an adherence to the Sharia um, or forming different councils, Majlis Ashura or consultative councils. You see those scattered uh, throughout the region. But then you have this radical trend as well. So really, ISIS is in many ways a successor to these other radical uh, movements that you know more recently have been through Osama bin Laden. And uh, like Osama bin Laden had a uh, journal, um, Dabak is the English language journal of ISIS. So there's really a tradition there. But there is another argument that doesn't get enough attention. And there is a big debate in the region about, well, no, the real challenge for us is not to fall back on Islam. And that's the narrative these folks push, right? We've, the troubles we're experiencing, the reason we're backward, the reason we're subject to colonial whims, the reason we fell prey to these colonial great powers, the reason we can't do anything in terms of changing U.S. policy in the region is we're weak because we've fallen away from the path of God. And that's a powerful narrative, right? And that's what the groups like IS are seizing on. But there is this other discussion that's going on that says, no, that's a false interpretation of our history. If you take a look at the broad history of Islam, and particularly even in the Arab world, we've actually got a longer history of tolerance than we do radicalism. Jews, Christians, um, and Muslims have coexisted for millennia in the Arab world, and we've done so just fine. And this is the tradition we need to reach back on. So there is a debate. Um, we don't often hear enough about that, I think, here. But this is just a sample. Another person, if you're interested in following um, kind of Arab perceptions uh, and opinion, Shibli Telhami is a professor at the University of Maryland, publishes widely. This is a phenomenal book in terms of tracing Arab public opinion polls over time and how attitudes have changed, um, not only to what's going on in the region, but also, of course, what they think of the U.S., U.S. foreign policy, American values, democracy, et cetera. So that's a great source for you. But you see here, I mean, this battle of identity right here, and it's kind of a third, you know, divided third, third, third. I'm a citizen of my country. No, I'm an Arab or I'm a Muslim. And it's kind of evenly split. And you see even within the course of a year, some, you know, important changes. I mean, the sense that I'm Syrian, Lebanese, Egyptian, relatively stable. But actually, the sense of being Arab actually increased. I think a lot of that you can attribute to actually the spread of the Arab Spring. Uh, media organizations like Al Jazeera have just uh, fueled the sense of, of Arabness and oneness in terms of an Arab nation. And interestingly enough, the sense of being a Muslim, despite all the attention given to the radical extremist movements here, has actually decreased, even within the course of a year. And a lot of that's been reaction to the, to the violence um, and the intolerant, barbaric acts of organizations like Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State. And then interestingly, again, is also kind of this emerging sense of, because of globalization, we're actually citizens of the world. So that's starting to change in the area as well. Um, both of these things essentially lead to, I'm going to, there we go, two failed states. And again, this is a good index. You can go to foreignpolicy.com type in fragile uh, uh, states in debts, and you know, these detailed reports about each of these countries will come up. But this just shows you that if you meld all these kind of measurements together in terms of uh, population growth, um, economic growth, poverty, um, legitimacy of security services, et cetera, if you collate all these into a formula, you see a lot of the most unstable, fragile states are located in the Middle East. Well, that's not good news for the long term, and this is one of the things I think, um, you know, just underscores that this is going to be a long haul. This is not going to be a problem the United States is going to solve today, tomorrow, next year, possibly even the next decade. Uh, so this is going to be, these are going to be events that transpire really over time because these organizations just thrive on that absence of effective, legitimate leadership and governance. 
Uh, you, you do have this sectarianism, and it's growing intense sectarianism in the region. Um, I think even the president, I would fault him on this, he talked about in his State of the Union speech about this, uh, these, uh, the thousand years of sectarian division in the Middle East. Again, well, yeah, but I mean, that's true everywhere. I mean, Europe hasn't fared necessarily so well in the 19th and 20th centuries either. As I recall, there were a few minor things like the Thirty Years' War, World War I, World War II. So yeah, there are always constant struggles. Um, and folks will attribute to uh, theology. I, I think in most cases, actually, particularly in modern times, um, really that theological debate, and it's real. I mean, there is a definite theological difference between Sunni Islam, which is the vast majority, and Shia Islam in the region. Um, but that also ma uh, masks kind of more traditional power politics. And that's what I think you really see playing out, particularly with Saudi Arabia now, um, trying to really play the Sunni card, play a leadership role in the, among the Sunni uh, countries of the region, and Iran, a Shia country, that uh, they hope, um, as long as they adhere to this nuclear agreement, that the lifting of sanctions will help boost their economy, boost their population, boost their fortunes, and probably boost their influence in the region as well. But so you've got this overlapping sense of really power politics and theological divide. Um, this divide was actually greatly aggravated by our invasion of Iraq in 2003. Uh, the Saudis, if you remember, were urging us very, very, they were very adamant, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Why? Because they saw um, Sunni Islam uh, represented in the form of Saddam Hussein sectarian, but at least Sunni, is a bulwark against Iranian Shia expansion in the region. And they were scared to death that we were going to unseat Saddam. And guess what? The majority of the population in Iraq are Shia. Well, if you're pushing a representative democratic transition, guess who's going to end up in power? Shia elements. So they were scared to death of that. And that really kind of just aggravated um, the sectarian tension. And this is, again, is something that ISIS is certainly exploiting. They intentionally exploited it after the uh, invasion in Iraq. And this was one of the divisions, actually, between the traditional al-Qaeda leadership that were kind of, that were discouraging um, attacks on Shia Muslims in the region because they wanted to build a broad-based popular support for their long-term caliphate in the region. But others, like Zarqawi and others, decided, no, we want to speed the sectarian war up. It'll drive more Sunni Muslims to our cause. And so they deliberately, intentionally focused on blowing up Shia shrines, Shia mosques, with the hope that they would explode the sectarian war and conflict. And sadly, in, in large part, they've successfully done so. And then you have information age. Technology doesn't cut necessarily one way or the other. It's neither good nor bad. Um, it certainly has increased and raised expectations, right? No matter where you are, almost you have some access to the internet and global information. You can see how the rest of the world is doing. And if you're living in a you know, straw hut somewhere in Yemen, you're kind of wondering, why am I here? And everybody else seems to be doing so well. Similarly, in Saudi Arabia, you know, if you're a poor Shia in the oil fields working, you're going, Saudi Arabia, my, my country, has $600 billion in reserves, and I'm living like I'm living now, that's just not right. So you have this, these increasing expectations and demands on the leadership. Um, it definitely speeds information flow reaction on the good side. This is how a lot of the movements, the uprisings, actually coordinated gathering together. They would do essentially kind of uh, flash mobs and organize, hey, we're going to meet in Tahrir Square at 1700 tonight to protest. And they would just put that out on social media. Uh, they could get there before the local police forces or military forces could react. And this is how they coordinated the uprising. Um, very quickly, though, uh, the uh, authoritarian leaders actually also learned, well, we can shut this down. We can actually use this to our advantage. We can target who the leaders are by their use of social media, throw them in prison, and actually put a put a damper on things. So this technology is cut in both ways. And certainly ISIS is, they've just been uh, masterminds in terms of their use of social media and drawing foreign and regional fighters to their cause. 
Um, overall, I mean, again, this isn't necessarily a good news story. It's my analysis. But I think we're, we're at the very early stages of a transition. From authoritarianism to what? I don't know. Um, but I do know it's going to be a wild roller coaster ride. It already has been. That's likely to continue. We're going to see a lot of setbacks. We're going to see some advances. Um, but it's going to be a lot of ups and downs for a long time to come. Decades, possibly generations. Um, you've got all those social economic problems and challenges we talked about briefly. None of those are going to be fixed. So anybody that comes to power is going to be facing those same broad scale social challenges, economic challenges, um, the tremendous poverty in the region, the corruption. And so ISIS is really, I think, it's more of a symptom than it is the disease itself. We could knock out ISIS tomorrow and it'll be the son of ISIS, whatever it is. It's going to be some other terrorist group that we're going to have to deal with. So deal with the disease if you're a policymaker. Don't just deal necessarily with the symptom itself. Um, these are also problems that don't lend themselves to ready solution by rapid, decisive use of military force, uh, despite what some folks are saying. Um, and, you know, if you're a war college graduate, you understand this ends ways, means formula. You almost can't have a lecture uh, without addressing this in some way, shape, or fashion. And toward the end, when I get a little bit more into policy, we'll take a look at this. But for a solid strategy, the essential argument is you have to have your objectives, you have to have your strategic concepts, and you have to have your resources and relative balance. Uh, my essential critique of the strategy we've got now is, is our, uh, we've got an outsized objective. The destruction of the Islamic State is highly unlikely. It's an ideology as much as it is a movement. And crushing that ideology with military force just doesn't have a great record of success. Um, so, you know, I think if we, if we could pare that back a little bit, maybe talk a little bit more about disruption, if people could be satisfied with that, that's maybe a little more realistic. We've also got kind of misaligned ways, right? Almost any debate about policy you hear nowadays is talking about what? Are we going to involve 10,000 troops? Are we going to deploy 30,000 troops? Are we going to deploy 60,000 troops? Are we going to gather an Arab coalition of 100,000 troops? Are, how much are we going to bomb them? Where are we going to bomb them? Um, that's all military-centric, but it doesn't get to any of those other routes that we talked about. So um, we have to rebalance and reprioritize, I think, our use of the instruments of power. And then lastly, whatever you decide, you have to adequately resource it. And if you don't adequately resource it, you've just got a recipe for a disaster. So a little humility as we go forward and get into a little bit of a discussion about uh, U.S. policy challenges ahead. Particularly in terms of the military instrument, we've tried just about everything. Right? I mean, and this is from, I'm cribbing from uh, Philip Gordon, who's a former NSC official in, uh, in the Obama administration here. Been in Iraq, massive U.S. military intervention for decades. And what do we see now? Chaos and instability. In Libya, what did we do? Light footprint, right? We're going to go in light, um, just a little bit of bombing. We, even that, we put the French and the Brits in the, in the forefront of that. And what's the result of that light footprint in Libya? Chaos and disaster. And then, of course, in Syria, we're not touching that at all. We're not going to get militarily engaged in that at all, at least for the longest time, although we're doing bombing runs now. But certainly no ground troops. And what's the reaction or the net effect in Syria? Chaos and disaster. So a little humility going forward, recognizing the complexity of the issues here. Um, quickly, in terms of the evolution, and I mean, I'll, I'll just make a couple points here. But there was no Al Qaeda in Iraq before the military invasion in 2003. None to speak of. Might have been one, two folks, sure. But certainly there was not a strategic or significant presence before our intervention in Iraq. And it was actually initially Al Qaeda in Iraq was the predecessor of present day um, Islamic State. And that was formed in direct opposition to U.S. military occupation of Iraq. So keep that in mind when we start thinking about how we ought to more aggressively get involved in Syria or anywhere else in the region as well. 
Now, on the upside, we did have this U.S. surge of Iraqi forces, and in combination with, um, by supporting Arab tribal leaders, actually very, very effective, really had al-Qaeda in Iraq on the ropes, effectively dismantled it as an effective organization. But as the uh, Maliki in particular came to power in Iraq, he was increasingly pursuing sectarian tensions. All the money that we were given to the Sunni Arab tribal leaders to arm and equip and support them financially went away. And the Iraqis, despite pledges to do differently, um, would not support these Sunni groups because the Shia folks in Baghdad were concerned about potentially arming uh, future opposition. So that funding support dried up. So in that kind of atmosphere of increased sectarianism, um, Al-Qaeda in Iraq got its boost, the Islamic State got a boost, and then they had the huge fortune of just total chaos in 2012 in Syria, and they expanded operations into that vacuum, gave them an incredible safe haven to actually uh, uh, grow and expand their caliphate. Um, so the key things here, again, I think, but just keep in mind, ISIS emerged actually as a reaction to what was viewed as foreign military intervention and occupation. And then think about that going forward and what it might mean for U.S. policy in Syria as well. Um, what is it today? I mean, I think it is important to understand and characterize to a certain extent what ISIS is and what it isn't. It, it really is a, it's in a sense, it's a hybrid. It's certainly a terrorist organization. It resorts to terrorist means, some of the most brutal terrorist activities um, we've seen and that are glorified um, horrifically in social media, um, in YouTube videos, YouTube clips, et cetera. So they, they're definitely, they're using terrorism for strategic results. Um, unlike prior terrorist groups, they actually are interested in holding territory and building a state. And this is a huge conceptual difference and strategic difference from Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda's philosophy was we're going to attack America first, weaken these apostate regimes we have in the region, and then through building broad-based popular support, we'll grow and build a caliphate under Islamic rule. Um, Islamic State said, no, we're building it now. We're taking it now. We're going to prepare for apocalyptic battles between um, non-Islamic forces and Islamic forces in Dabak, which is hence the name for their social magazine. We're going to do that now and actually kind of build um, and lead up to this apocalyptic vision of the end of the end of time, so to speak, um, which, you know, they're actively working forward to. Now, this presents some advantages, some disadvantages. Um, they actually find that they have to perform state functions now. That takes money, that takes resources, that takes time. And it also presents things that are more targetable from the U.S. standpoint. We can attack oil tankers. We can attack oil refineries. Um, and we can hopefully get at some of their financial support networks as well. Um, I think, you know, Stephen Wald is a professor at Harvard. He writes in foreign affairs a lot. He has a good characterization um, of what this movement is. And again, he paints it as, look, this isn't really unique. This is a revolutionary movement. It's definitely seeking to upturn the international order and current balance of power in the globe. It wants to transform the system. Um, it remarkably emerged, if you remember the Ba'ath in Iraq, were actually a secular party for the most part, but it merged this radical Islamic theology with Ba'athist support. So there are a lot of former Ba'ath Iraqi military officers who are in key leadership positions in the Islamic State right now, which I think has to at least account in part for some of their military successes on the battlefield. So that's, uh, that's something a little bit different, a little unique. But ultimately, he concludes, and I have a general tendency to agree with him here, ultimately, it's small, it's under-resourced, it's going to burn itself out, and it does not pose a significant threat. The risk is not zero, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but it doesn't pose a significant threat to the United States, and particularly uh, Western powers more generally. But this does lead to the debate. 
right? I mean, how significant is the threat? That's one of the things that's being debated right now in the United States. And like many foreign policy issues, it's kind of, I mean, it's a 51-49 split. You can make good cases either way. These are some of the advocates who are saying, no, this is a significant threat. We need to deal with it now, forcefully and decisively. Um, of course, Senator Graham, um, till recently a presidential candidate, but an important voice on defense issues, serves on the uh, Senate Armed Services Committee. Um, here you see it, it's a bipartisan effort here, so it's not just Republicans that are highlighting the threat here, it's Democrats as well. And Secretary Hagel, who was, you know, Republican, but served as Secretary of Defense under the Obama administration, actually says, no, this is an imminent threat to virtually every interest we have. So, I mean, this is an important debate to have. You have very solid, thoughtful folks arguing that this is a significant threat. You also have folks who say, well, hey, Don, not so much. Um, Dan Benjamin was a former counterterrorism official in the, uh, under Clinton when he was there. And he says, look, this threat's just being wholly exaggerated, way, way out of proportion to the threat that it actually is. Uh, Matthew Olson was director of the National Counterterrorism Center. He says, look, in no way does the Islamic State today represent a threat nearly as significant as pre-9-11 al-Qaeda. And you have really an evolution, I think, in terms of President Obama's attitude. I mean, at one uh, point, he uh, unfortunately, in retrospect, I'm sure he regrets, he referred to the Islamic State as a JV team of terrorists, right? Certainly a, a quip that he, uh, he regrets. But you see here, you know, initially, just in September 14, it's a future threat, right? At some point in the future, if left unchecked, this group could pose a growing threat. But this is, you know, a year later in December, and he recognizes, look, ISIL is a growing threat. It has to be dealt with. It's real, but we are going to overcome it. So we can have this discussion when we finish up, but it's an important debate to have. So my take. You know, what's the good news? Um, in the top graphic here you have, if you did a circle here with all the global terrorist um, casualties, it's that larger circle. Only 2.6% of the victims actually live in the Western territories. So statistically, it's not a great threat, objectively. I mean, look at these risks right here. You actually are what, a hundred, let me do the math, a thousand times more likely to die a choking than you are from a terrorist attack. And that's a time period that includes 9-11. You can imagine what those odds would be if you took out 9-11 with nearly 3,000 U.S. casualties. So we should be panicked every time we jump in the bathtub <laughs> here. You should be really scared you're going to fall out of your couch watching TV here, because you stand a much better shot of being killed in your living room than you do from a terrorist attack. And then, again, just look at, you know, relatively compare that with other casualties from other threats that are actually very close to home. And we don't need to get into domestic politics about Second Amendment rights or anything. But you see, you know, just 9,000 folks die a year in this country from firearm homicides, 120,000 folks have died in the drug cartel wars in Mexico, just south of our border. So compare that with, again, objectively, the uh, ISIS threat. Um, the other good news is Rand did a historical study of terrorist groups, and only 10% overall of terrorist groups ever succeed in achieving their objectives, and none of them were primarily a religious group. So historically, there's always an exception, right? But historically, you know, odds are pretty good that um, ISIS is eventually going to burn itself out. Um, achieving whatever goal that particular terrorist organization had. In some cases, it might be independence, whatever it is. So that's how they measured that. Um, why, there's a whole academic literature of why we inflate Fears. And given those minimal objective odds, I mean, it's shocking when you take a look at this Pew poll. I mean, because objectively the odds are so small. I mean, one in three and a half million 
I mean, it's a little bit better than winning the lottery, um, but, you know, not much. I mean, minute, minute odds. And yet 65% of the American public either are very concerned or are concerned about an attack occurring in the United States soon. I mean, so in the near proximity. So there's a huge gulf between a sense of fear and the objective measurement of what the threat is. A lot of reasons, and terrorism plays into all of them. Um, if, you, if you sense you don't have control in terms of dealing with a threat, you're much more concerned about it. Um, that's why people are much more afraid of flying in an airplane than driving in your car. Because in your car, you've got control. Even though statistically, you know, flying in a plane is like one of the safest modes of transportation, period, end of sentence. Um, and you have a much higher, higher risk of dying in a car accident. But you don't fear it because you're in control. But an airplane's scarier because you're not the pilot. You're not the one flying. So you don't know what they're dealing with up there. And terrorism's the same thing. Man-made um, risks are much more concerning to folks. That's why we're much more concerned about um, terrorist attacks than earthquakes, tsunamis, um, dying of heat exhaustion. I mean, actually, in that one slide, I think, you actually, you were four times more likely to die of heat exhaustion than you were in a terrorist attack. But again, one's kind of man-made, uh, and the other is just happens in nature, random choice, so it's of less concern. And certainly, terrorism preys on this in a big, big way. I mean, you get these media images, these photos, these videos of just flattened properties, blown up cars, um, gruesome body parts. I mean, it's, it's horrific. And that's what scares people. It's why you're afraid of a shark attack, right? I mean, you can just you visualize that. It's rare. You know it. But a shark attack is just scary because it, it's violent. It's bloody. I've seen it in a movie, Jaws or somewhere else. And it just underscores and preys on kind of your um, sense of fear. The real risk strategically is that what all this does is it impels people to more aggressive overreaction um, because that fear is outsized. And it's the big risk we've got in the policy side, I think. Um, and we can discuss this in Q&A. But is that you end up overreacting. And what does that do? That plays into the hands of the terrorists. It's essentially what um, Al-Qaeda was trying to do with 9-11, right? We can't get to America, or we will this once. But the primary purpose of it is to draw America into the region. And we'll bring targets to us, and we will sap them economically, emotionally, spiritually, et cetera, um, by involving them in a quagmire in our house. And so that's the, that's the risk strategically. Um, the good news is, I mean, there, there's, you know, they've lost, by most estimates, ISIS has lost anywhere between 20 and 25 percent of its territory since its heyday. So they're already geographically in a retreat mode. ISIS has no intent, and there's very little mass appeal for ISIS. That's why they highlight all these barbaric, gruesome videos. They're not trying to recruit sane people to their cause. That's not what they're, they're not even pretending they're interested in that. They are recruiting the extremists from the get-go, the dispossessed, the um, uh, disparagingly so, you know, the folks with serious mental issues. Let's, uh, let's leave it at that. Everywhere they go, they're building enemies. I mean, the one thing that's drawn Russia and the United States together these days is what? Is ISIS. We both recognize it as a, as a threat. So we're, we're finding ways to cooperate in Syria, even though, you know, we can't manage to talk to each other on Ukraine or Crimea or other issues here. So they're building enemies all along the way. Ultimately, the brutality is counterproductive. I mean, they're, um, you know, as they build their state, they're relying on taxing people. But if you have an unstable environment where you can't get any kind of investment or business, eventually that source of income runs dry because people don't have any money or anything you can tax them for. And people are fleeing occupied territories of ISIS uh, for that reason. So their very funding source is kind of drying up. And yes, it, because of the oil, it's arguably the best funded terrorist organization in the world. But if it's, if it's attempting to build a state, if it's attempting to build a caliphate, 
it's actually one of the poorest countries in the world. So it doesn't have enough resources. There's essentially a, a huge negative cash flow every month. Even though they've got a lot of oil, they've got a lot of expenses and they can't, their expenses are outpacing their uh, revenues. Uh, the bad news is, of course, even, you know, I'm not reading Intel anymore these days, but you just read the media and their, you know, intelligence reports going to the president are saying, look, you're saying this is a contained organization, but it's not. And, you know, we have the Jakarta attacks uh, just the other day that kind of prove um, at least they're getting footholds in other places overseas, arguably in reaction because of the contraction they've been facing in Iraq and Syria recently. Uh, the bad news is if you take a look at the casualty, you know, counts, the Pentagon is saying we've, we st ISIS started with about 30,000, 20 to 30,000 troops. Look at how many folks we think we've killed. We think we've killed about 20 or 30,000 troops. What's the current estimate for the size of ISIS today? 20 or thousand, 20 to 30,000 folks. So they're replacing folks literally as quickly as we can kill them. So they still have a powerful recruiting tool. They're still taking full advantage of that. Um, we knew even before San Bernardino that ISIS was already in the States. This report by George Washington University uh, already tagged in 2015 at least 56 individuals. So we know they're here. They're already here. We're not going to keep them out um, regardless of what we do in terms of immigration policy or anything like that. People are self-radicalizing on their own, online. Uh, they don't need a physical presence here to actually recruit. Uh, the bad news is we're going to suffer other attacks. I mean, that's, that's the nature of terrorism. The government has to prevent every single attack to be successful, and the terrorists only have to be lucky once in terms of getting through. And those odds just won't hold for long. Eventually, there will be another terrorist attack. There are a lot of what they originally called lone wolves, folks acting independently. This is something that ISIS actually encourages. Again, very different from Al-Qaeda, as they are encouraging people to act on their own. Come join our Islamic State in Iraq and Syria if you can, but if you can't, go kill the infidels on your own, on your own schedule, using your own devices in whatever your home country is. And then some folks, and you've seen this actually with like the French attack, you're getting this kind of characterized terms of lone wolves. I mean, folks who are just looking for a convenient way to be killed by someone else. And this was the, I mean, a guy strapping a fake suicide bomb in France and attacking a police force. It's not exactly a rational act. I mean, it's somebody who was actually looking to be killed, and we're probably going to see some of those. Um, again, for the good and bad news, terrorist organizations over time, as their goals and objectives are frustrated and they can't achieve them, they fragment, they adapt, they adapt, but they also radicalize because the argument is, as bad as you were, you didn't achieve your objective, so we're going to be badder and uglier, and we're going to achieve the objective. So take a look at, at most organizations, particularly ones in the Middle East, Hezbollah, um, Hamas, et cetera, uh, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, um, and you know just the different variations you have of that. And that's just a typical pattern you'll see. Um, so what are the challenges to U.S. policy? I mean, I think, and we can discuss this, but I don't think GWAP by any objective measure, this global war on terrorism, has really been effective, right? We've certainly been at it for a long time, since 2001, but we've still got Al-Qaeda. We've now got um, ISIS, so it, it just is not going to eliminate the threat, and I think it's probably foolish to actually think so. The other risk is, as I've alluded to before, military action can actually be counterproductive. Um, there have been any number of academic studies about this, but here you see 95% um, of all suicide attacks in response to perceived foreign occupation. So you, you, know, you just have to deal with the reality that this may be necessary, you may need to do it, but it's very likely to have this counterproductive effect. And as we've talked about, all these regional factors are going to continue to give rise to extremist groups, whether it's ISIS or something else. Um, everybody admits that there's no military solution, but we sure as heck act 
as if there is. I mean, candidate Romney admitted, look, we can't kill our way out of this. Uh, President Obama at West Point said, just because you have the best hammer doesn't mean every problem's a nail. In other words, you know, the military is not the appropriate instrument of national power for every issue here. He has actually conducted uh, nine times as many drone strikes as President Bush did during his tenure. So there's a very active, you know, military operations going on, whether it's in Pakistan, Afghanistan, Yemen, Iraq, or Syria now. Um, so we just can't seem to get away from using the military as, a, as an interest here. We also have huge problems with our coalition partners here. Now on the upside, we've assembled a coalition of over 60 different countries that are formerly part of our anti-ISIS coalition. But guess what? Every country brings with them their own limitations, their own particular objectives, their own national interests, their own perceptions of what the problem is. You know, the big division, of course, we have is between the U.S., Saudi Arabia, Gulf countries on one side, arguably Turkey, on one side supporting the Free Syrian Army and the anti-Assad rebels in Syria, and on the other side you have Russia, Iran, Hezbollah, and kind of the Shia um, alliance here supporting Assad. So that's a huge difference and a huge challenge um, with Russia trying to support Assad, us saying he really needs to go, but we both need to cooperate in the fight against ISIS. That's one. Certainly Turkey, you know, what is the U.S. doing? We want, we're supporting the Kurds. They've arguably been the most effective ground force fighting ISIS, peeling them back, reversing their territorial gains. We want to support them. We want to support them more. But Turkey is paranoid about the Kurds and don't want them to have an independent state, don't want to arm. They're very concerned that the arms of the uh, Kurds we equip will actually find their way to terrorist organizations uh, that Turkey considers terrorist organizations, Kurdish organizations, such as the PKK. And regardless, the U.S. is doing all the heavy lifting here. I mean, there's a list of 60 coalition partners here, but guess what? 95% of the airstrikes are being conducted by the good old U.S. of A. So we are still doing the heavy lifting here. The refugee flows are serious, they're phenomenal. If you watch NPR uh, NewsHour, um, you, they told a story last night about Ayan uh, Kurdi, he was a three-year-old boy who washed up on the Turkish shores. His family recently um, got to Canada, um, immigrated to Canada, and just the, the stories that they have to tell about their journey, multiple efforts to flee Syria, the emotional impact of what it means to actually say goodbye to your home, your homeland, all the possessions you have. I mean, and there are literally millions of those same stories. Over half of the Syrian population, over half of the 22 million are now refugees, either internally displaced or positioned in refugee camps scattered throughout the region. It's definitely putting strain on the region here. Turkey taking close to 2 million. Lebanon. Uh, taken over a million. The entire population of Lebanon is six million. So you can imagine the, the strains that's placing in the region as well. So what's the strategy? And we've got maybe five or ten more minutes here. We'll get into the strategy piece now that we've got all the background here. Essentially, the president's actually been fairly consistent. And the top was his uh, 2014 address to the nation outlining what the strategy would be. Okay, airstrikes in terms of military, we're going to support other forces in the region, Iraq and Iraq, the Syrian opposition in Syria. Uh, we'll continue to do traditional counterterrorism um, operations, whether it's information campaigns, improving intelligence, um, or countering and attacking their funding sources, and we'll provide humanitarian assistance. Um, he updated this strategy in December of last year with a big addition being right here, a, di a diplomatic piece. He says, okay, we're going to, in addition to everything we're doing, we're going to pursue a long-term political resolution to the issue in Syria. Um, so we kind of gave a little bit on Assad must go, and we're saying, 
president's now saying, well, you must go, but not necessarily tomorrow. So we can have in place a transition plan and maybe get some overlapping interest with, uh, that would be acceptable to Russia um, and the Assad regime. So he wants to add that to the strategy. Um, what are our options here? Class at staff action um, options. I have to give you three strategic options to consider, right? And um, I'll lay these out. Um, and I, I've, you know, got them here and just want to highlight the risk. But, but they're, all, they're all, to one extent or another, viable options, right? Um, in ugly situations like this, very frequently, the U.S. is left with no good options. If there were good options, they'd be easy, we'd be done, there would be no debate. What you're left with is, is a series of relatively less bad options. And more often than not, they're all bad, they're just bad in different ways. So you gotta choose what risk you're gonna have to take with each option. Uh, there's definitely the ground invasion school. Again, very thoughtful, sensible folks making this argument, um, this General Jones, uh, Marine Corps retired. He was the first national security advisor to President Obama. He's kind of an advocate of this approach, as is Lindsey Graham here. Um, what are the risks? Um, I, I mean, to me, it's we've done we've seen this play before. I mean, we did it in Iraq, we did it in Afghanistan, and we did not only did we do it, but we did it for more than ten years, and it it didn't end. Well, so what makes Syria different? Maybe you can make the case that Syria is different, but that's a big question I think the folks who advocate this particular option need to consider. Um, this is one estimate. Uh, uh, Biddle is, um, is a scholar. He actually used to teach at the War, teach at the War College. His wife still teach, teaches air power here, but um, He's down in Washington, one of the think tanks, I think, Council on Foreign Relations. His military estimate is it would take about 160,000 ground troops to secure. That's just the territory that ISIL occupies right now. That's not reestablishing control over the entire country. So this is a sizable military venture. And someone's got to provide those ground troops. And I think people do forget You've got Russia, literally has a big dog in this flight. Fight. They're flying missions over Syria. They now have some element of ground troops and artillery units and air defense units in Syria. And Russia may be a declining, I think it is a declining power, but it's still got the second largest nuclear arsenal in the world. So you're still talking, it may, may be a small probability, but you can see where this could spin a little bit out of control. If Russian air defense system happened to shoot down a U.S. aircraft, where do we go from there? So I think it's something worth considering. Um, option B, this is something that uh, our president, uh, presidential candidate Hillary Clinton is advocating. Well, we need to just enforce some no-fly zones. We did that in northern Iraq with the Kurds fairly successfully so. But I think the risks were also really laid out phenomenally well by uh, then uh, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Dempsey, in an open letter to Secretary or Senator Levin, and you can actually pull that up. But, I mean, if you do that in a foreign country, it's an act of war. I mean, you are saying we are now controlling the airspace over your territory and shoot us down or try and fight us. And I mean, so that's, the, that's, what you're, that's what you're into if you decide to enforce no-fly zones. You also, it really, even though it's an enforced primarily through the air, it takes ground troops, because only ground troops hold terrain. And if you have no viable ground troop presence, then all the air power isn't necessarily gonna make all the difference in the world, because you can, and most, of, most of the deaths in the Syrian civil war, are due to ground fire and artillery attacks. So how is a no-fly zone gonna really turn the tables in this fight? I don't think it's particularly likely. It's also not cost-free. And again, you kinda have to consider what happens next. What if the no-fly zones don't work? What if Syrian ground forces, Russian ground forces, move into the no-fly zones? What do we do then? 
Do we attack the Syrian forces? Probably pretty easy. Do we attack the Russian forces? Probably a bigger, tougher question. And then option C, and of course I always leave that last because it's my personal preferred option. Right? So, so this is the obvious one. It's not without risk, but I think you do, you do a containment plus. We're not going to eliminate ISIS as a threat. It's an ideology. The best analog there, I would say, you know, communism didn't die because we destroyed it militarily. It died of its own weight because it's a morally corrupt, inefficient ideology. It doesn't produce. And if we have confidence in our own ideology, our own system, I think ultimately ISIS ideology will die of its own dead weight, its own internal contradictions, its own brutality, its own uh, drive for isolationism, if you will. Um, but that's going to take some time. Um, and then we use the uh, War College. We always use full range instruments of national power, right? Military, informational, diplomatic, and uh, economic. And, and the big challenge, and the thing I don't think we've really got our heads around or certainly haven't addressed, is the, the amount of economic resources it would take to really address those long term challenges like unemployment, um, et cetera. So, what's the big risk? This is what the president talked about. It's going to require strategic patience. Will we have it? Maybe. Um, you know, one of our great strengths as Americans is we don't, right? I mean, we're going to solve a problem. There is no problem too great. You want to get to the moon? We will get to the moon. You want to cure cancer? We will get to that cure for cancer. There is no problem too great. Um, strategic problems have a tendency to be not quite as, as, uh, as fits. And of course, if we have another terrorist attack, probably goes out the window. Don't know if the public would tolerate that or the leadership would tolerate it. So here's how, you know, what I think we need to do to kind of rebalance, and we can talk about this. But what's the strategic objective? Is destruction and defeat, that's the current objective. Is that feasible? Can we really do it? If not, is the American public, is the American leadership going to be okay with just, well, it's good enough if we just disrupt their attack. It's good enough if we generally contain them to limited attacks elsewhere other than U.S. soils. Is that acceptable? Um, the ways, I mean, I think we're, we're way too military-centric. So how do we bring other instruments of power to bear? And then lastly, will we uh, resource this sufficiently? Right now, the big hole here is we don't have a reliable ground force. Um, Kurds have done what they can do. But guess what? Other Arab communities and villages and towns and cities don't want the Kurds liberating their towns or cities. So they've kind of reached the limit of their advance. It's the same problem you've got in Iraq. Um, it's, ISIS is largely a Sunni organization, and Sunni populations aren't really interested in these Shia militias, militias coming in and liberating their town and maybe occupying it afterwards. So that's a huge hole. And I don't see any appetite here for a, a Marshall Plan equivalent of tremendous millions, if not billions, of dollars in economic aid or assistance to address those long-term challenges. Um, this is just worth pondering a little bit, and I think it's something the president has struggled with, right? We talked about why we exaggerate that threat of terrorism, and the American public is visibly concerned about terrorism. It might be outsized, I think it is, but that concern is real. So but how do you address it without further stoking fear? How do you address it without undermining our own values, traditions, and freedoms? And to a certain extent, that's a traditional debate between security, vice, freedoms. But it's really intensified you know, in this atmosphere, and you certainly see it um, intensified in terms of the political campaign for president right now. But to kind of paraphrase Roosevelt, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Right? So we shouldn't be fearful. This is the message the president's trying to convey. Uh, but the American public uh, certainly is. And I think if I've got this right, yeah. So that's it. So Mike, you wanted to break a little bit? Or?
Before we move into our question uh, session, one of the things I have to do, I do all the time is take some attendance. Now we did set an all-time attendance record, all right, um, and I stopped counting at 275. Okay, so uh, when we come to the end, we're going to have to leave here very orderly and, and listen to my instructions, <laughs> because and just one other comment for the future, if we uh, exceed the, the seats that we have set up and we go to add seats, we're going to start by adding rows in the front rather than in the back. We'll start by adding a row in the front. Uh, so, uh, so we have 275 people, probably a little more, but I stopped counting. <laughs> That's as far as I, didn't, I ran out of digits. <laughs> I left my abacus at home. Uh, but I always take count of uh, individuals from the Army. Any, if you're connected with the Army War College, could you please raise your hand? If you're a student there, work there. Because the, the CGs always like to know how the support is from uh, the, the War College. And also uh, Mechanicsburg, work at the facility over there. Mechanicsburg Naval, I guess it's not called the Navy Depot anymore, but that gives you my age. Nav sub or whatever it's called. Could you raise your hands again if you work there? Thank you. And um, I th we're, we're going to move uh, directly into the, the, the Q&A, and I'm going to run uh, around with the microphone. Okay, so uh, someone willing to be number one? <laughs> I, can re I can get to you quickly. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, given the tremendous instability in this part of the world, uh, ISIS being maybe just a little bit of it, mm -hmm. do you think that this is just more of the same given the history of Islam? Seventh and eighth centuries, they conquered a good part of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't kill Christians, mm -hmm. but they were second-class citizens. Uh, they were heavily taxed. Uh, and they certainly weren't, they, they wanted to uh, convert everybody. So uh, it seems like we're going to have to d put up with this forever, that uh, there's going to be fighting there. They're going to be killing each other. Uh, you know, look at Sharia. Uh, look at uh, jihad as uh, written about in the Quran. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, I guess, what is your opinion? Is, is it more of the same? Or? Well, I mean, I, I do think, I mean, what's different now, I think, is the scale of those socioeconomic challenges. I mean, when you're talking about 30% of the population living in poverty under $2 a day, that's a huge, huge challenge for any government. I mean, I think it's overblown to say they've just been killing each other for centuries. So have we. We had our own civil war. Um, we have a lot of people die due to firearms every day here. So we had, you know, um, nine uh, black American citizens killed in a church down south. It was intended to spark a race war. So, you know, every society has these tensions to one extent. Or another, Sharia law is what you interpret Sharia law to be. Um, Sharia law in Indonesia is very different than Sharia law in Saudi Arabia. So this is, I think, this is an internal battle that Muslims themselves are having to consider um, and decide really how flexible they want to be with interpreting their religious text. Now, we've, we've had that debate, right? I mean, you can find ugly, ugly text in terms of the Old Testament, right? But in general, we ignore that. I mean, we don't kill our daughters. We don't, uh, you know, support and advocate slavery. Um, so we've found ways to kind of interpret the text in different ways, and that's what Muslims are going to have to do for themselves. I think that's one of the limitations we need to recognize, I think, as Americans, is there's, we can support other voices in that debate, but um, our voice is going to ring a little bit hollow 
for them in the region. So uh, we've seen other radical ideologies, uh, Red Brigade in Europe, uh, whether underground in this country, uh, burn themselves out. How is this any different? Um, I'm hoping it's not different. What, what is a little bit, has a little bit of an enduring character to it is particularly Sunni Islam has no hierarchical clerical authority. So there is no equivalent to a pope who can say that's the wrong interpretation of this text. Or you're, you're, you may have mentioned this particular text, but you forgot about the Muhammad's um, adv advocacy for there is no compunction in religion. You can't compel people in religious matters. Um, Islam doesn't have that. It's a, it's a sense of if you can get people around you to believe that you've got the right interpretation and you can get those people to follow you, that's what you're left with. So there is kind of this inherent fractured nature in Sunni Islam that, that kind of leads to these periodical, periodic upheavals. So I suspect we'll see some version of this down the road. Although, you know, again, if you take a look at the polls across even the Arab world, it's useful remembering that the, where's the majority of the Muslim population in the world? It's in Indonesia, right? The Arab world is not the center, population-wise, of Islam. It's certainly the center of gravity in terms of theology, Mecca and Medina. Um, but, yeah, I think we'll see rises and falls of these extremist ideologies. Um, it'll just be more or less violent. Right now, obviously, we're at, a, at an apex of violence. But public opinion polls, Al-Qaeda is not popular in the Arab world. Um, ISIS is not popular in the Arab world. Um, but it doesn't take many these days uh, to cause trouble. So even a very few can really cause a serious problem, sadly. Tell me, in your opinion, how this situation, if it would be different, and how it would be different if the U.S. had not invaded Iraq in 2003? Yeah, it's really an interesting counterfactual, right? Particularly given what we've seen with the Arab uprisings. I mean, the, the counterfactuals are, it's inherently unprovable. That's the nature of a counterfactual. You're just kind of positing an alternative history. But think about how it might have been different if we hadn't invaded Iraq, and the Arab Spring actually had taken hold in Iraq in and of itself, and the Iraqis themselves had ousted Saddam. I mean, that might be, at least it wouldn't be as anti-American a bent. We wouldn't be holding the blame. Um, I suspect just because of the numbers involved, as I think about this just out loud, probably there would have been a Shia would have come to the fore just because they're the majority in the country, so might it have ta still taken a sectarian division, possibly, but maybe in the process of doing the uprising themselves, maybe they would have found a way to cooperate with each other and kind of look over the sectarian differences and, and find a way to, to work together. Um, certainly one of, the, one of the effects of civil war is you have this self-separation, right, because the government can't provide security for you who do you turn to? Turn to your neighbors, your set, your religious compatriots, because somebody's got to provide that security. It's the same phenomenon with gangs in inner cities. I mean, people are drawn to the gangs because they need some mechanism of protection, and the gang provides it. Well, in this case, uh, you know, they started looking to sectarian um, colleagues, and so what you had, what were tremendously integrated cities like Baghdad, and all of a sudden, entire sectors of the uh, Sunni Baghdad were left. People just fled for fear of retaliation and attack from Shia militias. And so you get this division of society. The same thing happened in many areas in the Balkans. Um, but, you know, there is an alternative there that would might have posit that maybe by working together and overthrowing Saddam on their own rather than having us do it, they would have learned a few things in the process and maybe avoided where they're at now. That's a, it's an interesting thought.
I'm doing a master's thesis on how does covert action affect terrorism. Right. My question to you is, what is the CIA doing to counter ISIS? If I knew about it, I couldn't talk about it. <laughs> oh. I mean, so that, oh, I know what you know in terms of reading the papers, right? I mean, certainly there was a CIA effort, CIA effort to bolster some Syrian opposition in the country, right? I mean, I think it was something like $500 million. And it was a huge flop. I mean, tremendous flop. As soon as they ended up training like a handful of folks for that $500 million, it was what, maybe, how many folks was it? 12, a dozen, two dozen. And almost as soon as they crossed the border, they were compromised and scarfed up. Um, I mean, that's one of the things the president, before considering whether we should assist the opposition in Syria, he asked the CIA, what's the history of success of supporting these insurgent groups? Find me a history of success. Find me a, a theory that will prove the case. And guess what their answer was? None. Can't tell you. This would be the first. Let's go do it anyway. Let's. I might have everything all wrong, and that's pretty normal. But, but uh, I mean, when you think about maybe a little bit, there might be a little bit of an analogy. I mean, when the United States started its war for freedom against England, I mean, it, it was a civil war, and certainly terrorist-type activities were used in order to achieve the objective. And we also... Uh, you know, made nice with France, uh, and not the, the second. That, so that's so there might be something there. I don't know. I mean, we don't. We I don't believe anybody used uh, women and children as human shields. Uh, maybe we did. I hope not. Uh, the 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 other thing is is that it it brings to mind the Shia Sunni conflict that appears to be present, which I guess occurred after during or after, right after Muhammad, the prophet. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, what about the Ottoman Empire? Well, I mean, it, it was a great empire. Uh, how did it deal with the Sunni-Shia conflict? And is there anything to be learned from the, the operation of the Ottoman Empire and uh, its demise? Uh, or are we left with a mess because of its demise? Um, yeah, I think obviously we're left with a mess, right? That's, that's the easy question. Maybe I should probably quit there. Um, we think, I mean, there are a lot of historical analogies, right? Particularly in terms of how long this is going to last. If you take a look at the course of revolutions, not just the U.S., but French Revolution as well, these are long-term affairs. They frequently get a lot uglier and more brutal and more violent before they get better. So in that sense, there probably are some insights to learn. Um, one of the differences with ISIS, though, would be, I mean, there is no compromise with ISIS. I mean, when you're talking about a, a terrorist organization that has political goals and objectives, whether it's overthrow of the government, whether it's more representation, whatever it is, those are things that are kind of measurable and offer some measure a room for compromise. There, Frank, there is no room for compromise with an organization like ISIS. So there, I guess the um, you know the lessons learned would um, would probably end. There's not a, a not not a lot to say there. The um, the Ottoman Empire. I'm not a historian, but I mean, like any empire, uh, the empires that were successful actually were decentralized. Um, what they they learned to accommodate local cultures and traditions. And so maybe there's a lesson learned um, for us and others, too. I mean, maybe we need a little more hands-off approach. Um, and similarly, maybe the, the authoritarian governments there in the region probably have to learn that lesson, too, right? I mean, that's one of the things in Iraq is they're, they're talking about a federation, right? You've got to give more autonomy to the Kurds. Um, and certainly you have to provide more maneuver room for the Sunnis as well. So maybe there are some lessons learned in terms of local accommodations there that folks could apply in the region. Uh, Chris, the, uh, the stone on Ellis Island says, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. 
But now I understand there's plane loads, unmarked planes, that are landing in the United States with refugees, approved by the current administration, who have defined the opposition as the JVs. Do you have any feeling on what is going on behind? I don't know anything about plane loads of refugees. I do know my own personal sense is what made this country great was diversity. And that's, that's a source of our strength. One of the reasons we're not an old, aging, um, unproductive economy that's overly you know, socialized in terms of providing benefits um, for retirees is because we accept immigrants to come here and work. And that provides a new foundation for workers, uh, broader base for taxes. And, um, and so personally and morally, I'm much more of the, you know, we're, we're better off. If we isolate the refugees, what does that do in the longer term? I think, it, I mean, that, that does what ISIS wants to do, right? Their major point is, as Muslims, you cannot live in a Western society. You will never be accepted in a Western society. You have no future in another country. Come live with us in our Islamic caliphate. And so if we shut that off, we're, we're playing right into their hands. And they say, see, I told you so. Some are. Some are. Some aren't. I mean, um, I'm not, I mean, I think that's what you, you have law enforcement to handle that. If people are advocating and participating in violence, we've got law enforcement mechanisms to handle it. So let them handle it. A question here. Uh, yep. it seems Where's like Mike? Mike, are you going to? Right here. Did he go? Where are you at? Oh, do you want to? Okay, you're trying to buy. I mean, I. You, okay. Okay, we're going over to this side. Sure, how about in the back there? Got the mic. <laughs> After, oh, okay, all right. Seems like the problem that they're creating are, are refugees. Mm -hmm. This is the problem for the world. It is. And the solution seems to be for the refugees, the millions of them, to get up and just move. Uh, <laughs> Why is it so hard for the millions and millions of refugees to go fight these people? Or should we just give them guns and say, look, you don't really don't want to move. Why don't you go back and kill these people? Yeah, I mean, there, you know, I, I think the big problem there is why, I mean, the, the big problem there is who are you arming, you don't know. I mean, so is that really what you want to do? And I mean, the, the fact that they're fleeing probably tells you something that they're not happy, they're not satisfied with the way things are, so they're looking for a better future. In countries like Germany, I mean, this is one of the reasons Germany's been one of the most accepted countries, is because they, they recognize they need a younger, more vibrant labor force. And so they're actually, that's one of the reasons they're welcoming them. Um, Canada has a very welcoming policy. Um, I don't see any issue with that. Will there be crime, like there was crime in Cologne? Yeah, absolutely. But they may go back. I mean, they do make us better, but a lot of them may well go back when, it, um, when the opportunity presents itself. But moderate folks inherently aren't inclined to take up weapons and kill folks. I mean, the folks who are inclined to do that are folks with rather extreme views on either side anyhow. So I'm not... You know, I think the course of civil wars is actually, it's historically, it's aggravated by outside powers providing weapons, equipment, and supplies um, because that just keeps adding fuel to the fire. So if you want to extinguish it, one of the ways to do it is actually limit the flow of the weapons, money, and support, and then it kind of dies out when you get a stabilized situation. You can bring people back. In Libya, some of the first people coming back were exiles because they, they lived out of the country, some of them for their whole lives, but they felt an obligation 
to go back and build a better country, take what they've learned here, take their, um, what they know from Western values, Western culture and traditions, and transplant that back home. So maybe that's a better, brighter future. I don't know. Doc, Dr. Boland, uh, thanks for a great talk today. I want to take a step back from uh, the ISIL problem specifically um, to the sort of Arab Spring uh, through 2014 uh, activities in Syria. And I recall a lot of rhetorical support for those movements from the U.S. government, uh, sort of an idealistic uh, pro-democracy message coming out of the United States. And I wonder if um, our idealism uh, has resulted in a morally inferior outcome than a more realist approach advocating international stability might have. Um, and I wonder if you might comment on that and perhaps uh, some of the policy lessons we might have learned uh, from the Arab Spring. Yeah, I mean, I think the Arab Spring is what really put us on the horns of a dilemma. I mean, we clearly have our support for American values, right? That's generally served us pretty well. And there's broad-based literature that says democratic representative countries are far less inclined to go to war against other democracies. They may go to war elsewhere, but they're far more peaceful, productive societies as a whole. So there's some utility in the long term in promoting that kind of vision, governments and governance and tolerance, right? But the, the tension there is what are your interests served by, your short-term interests. You need state cooperation to pursue counterterrorism. You need a stable situation to get the energy resources of the region out. Um, so there's always been this tension between what do we support. For decades, we've been supporting the, we'll wave, do a hand wave for our US values, and we'll support authoritarian regimes in the region that will give us those short-term interest. Um, but in the long term, that arguably hasn't worked out so well. So in, in any rate, this I think these are locally inspired events, right? So these are going to take a direction all on their own regardless of what we do. Um, and we will be and have been condemned for both sides, right? We're condemned in Egypt for too easily letting Mubarak go, as if we had a choice. But, right, that's one of the things the Saudis and other authoritarian leaders were really concerned about. You let this decade-long ally go without any visible means of support. So they condemned us for that. Um, and then on the, on the other hand, we're being condemned for supporting the Islamists like Morsi. And then when Morsi was overthrown, we were condemned for supporting the military dictator again, uh, Sisi. So it's a, it's a bit of you're going to be condemned any way you go. One clear lesson learned, I think, is you, from Syria, regardless of what party or whatever you sit on, is you don't declare red lines unless you know what you're talking about. You're going to stick and enforce those red lines. Um, I think, you know, ultimately I think the democratic, the, the diplomatic resolution to the chemical weapons was probably far more productive and effective than a military solution would have been. But nonetheless, that just crushes your credibility. It gives false hope to opposition movements who will read that like they want to read it, which is, okay, we've got the U.S., a global superpower behind us. Let's continue this on our own. Um, and so that's, a, that's one of the few clear lessons learned, I think, is that one. There was, there was one uh, recent uh, Saudi Arabia initi initiative to, to build a coalition to fight against ISIS. And, and how can we see uh, this Arab going together uh, against ISIS to Middle East as a whole, to the peace in the Middle East? And I particular because Syria is just beside Israel. Mm -hmm. Well, there's, I mean, this is another dilemma, right? And foreign policy is full of them. That's what makes it so interesting, but it's what makes it so tough. I mean, you would think in theory a, you know, the Saudi, Saudis stepping up, trying to form a coalition that's anti-ISIS would be generally good, right? And it's a shared goal we have. The dilemma is what? That feeds exactly into that sectarian conflict because did they include Iraq, Iran in the coalition? 
No, I mean, so there are no Sunni or Shia countries from the Middle East included in the coalition. So all you're doing is you're supporting the sectarianism that is feeding what? That is feeding ISIS, the organization you're trying to crush. So it's a, it's a dilemma the U.S. is stuck trying to walk a little bit on both sides. And there's a big argument now for what should we pick sides? And certainly I know in class, you know, a lot of the Gulf Arab officers, U.S. needs to pick a side. Get with us. I mean, you got to be with us. It's you're with us or against us, kind of the flip side of the uh, Bush speech to others post 9-11. Um, and they, they want us clearly to pick a side and support the Sunnis. Um, I'm not convinced from a U.S. standpoint that's the right thing to do. But, but it's definitely a dilemma. You highlight it really well. Yes, um, the country of Jordan, <coughs> excuse me, has for a long time been very um, welcoming of refugees, and um, they have some uh, fairly strong pro-Western ties and uh, a fairly enlightened leader. Uh, I'm wondering, um, having um, served in Jordan or worked in Jordan, if you have any concerns that their stances and their positions make them more likely to be targeted by ISIL or become less um, uh, safe? Well, yeah, I mean, that's a big concern. It's one of the reasons we've done so much to actually support Jordan. The U.S. is still the largest humanitarian contributor um, to the refugees um, in the region. But it's a problem for Jordan because if you're familiar with them, I mean, they're a fairly small country. Uh, they've already got um, a number of Palestinian refugees. That's, uh, that's a concern for them. And now you're adding to this, I think it was nearly 700,000 Syrian refugees for a very, very small country that does not have the economic resources to handle this. So we've been providing a lot of the funding. Um, to your prior question, I mean, they've, they've already been a prime target for ISIS. Um, uh, horrifically, they burned a Jordanian pilot that they captured. So they, they for a long time have been in the in the sights of ISIS and that's that's a big concern for the United States. Um, and as you point out, I mean Jordan's been a been generally a stalwart ally, although these things do go up and down. When I first went to Jordan, we had actually cut off all of our military assistance programs to them because uh, King Hussein was not um, supportive of our invasion of Iraq. So we had a rebuild period, but generally they have been very supportive. That's a big concern for the United States, absolutely. Uh, Colonel Lewis from the War College class of 2016. If you had a crystal ball and you followed the uh, containment strategy to the T and capitalized on that, in your estimation, how long is this going to take to to burn out or fix? Yeah, less, um, I mean, I, I, I think it's easily, it's a decades-long decades long endeavor. And, and again, the, the containment won't be perfect. I mean, containment of the Soviet Union and communism wasn't perfect, but it, it worked pretty well over the long haul. But that, too, was a decades-long um, effort with a lot of setbacks. Um, it drew the United States into places, Vietnam, where arguably we shouldn't have been. Um, and that may well happen with the U.S. as well. So I wish I had a happier crystal ball on that one. Uh, the legitimacy of Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi is in question, and so are a lot of the leaders in the region. Uh, how much do you think al-Khilafah has appeal in the region by young Muslims uh, in the Middle East and throughout the Muslim world. Yeah, this was, a, I mean, this was a bold, bold, contentious move by Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi to proclaim himself caliph. I mean, that was, that was huge, and it was hugely risky, and it was condemned in many, many sectors, you know, in countries of the region as well. But the, I think, and you may well know better than I do, but I think, you know, we have this inherently, as Americans, we have this inherently... Um, repulsive reaction to the mention of a caliph or a caliphate, right? But Muslims don't necessarily, right? I mean, that was a positive time in their history. I mean, they had 
they had actually, you know, they enjoyed a tremendous empire. It was multicultural. It was tolerant. It was multi-ethnic. It was prosperous. It was very advanced. I mean, when Europe was in its dark ages were some of the brightest days of the Islamic empire pursuing physics, science, medicine. Um, so the mention of the pure mention of a caliphate, I think, doesn't get the doesn't get the off-putting reaction among Muslim youth. The idea of, of itself as a as a construct can actually be quite positive, and that's part of the appeal, I think, of younger folks going to the region is they want to be something, they want to be part of that something larger. And for the most part, these youths are very um, they're disoriented particularly culturally. I mean, I think it's no coincidence that a lot of the recruits are coming from where Muslim minority areas in Europe. I mean, so they've been dislocated from their own home and culture. They're transplanted in a Western culture, and they kind of feel like I'm neither fish nor fowl. I'm neither really Arab, but I'm not French. So they're alienated, and they're looking for that larger cause, and, and so the idea of being a constructive participant in building a caliphate is attractive for some. I mean, did you have anything else you want to add? Do you think I hit the mark, or am I off? Okay, all right, nice. Yeah, yeah, well, I'm, again, I try and be an optimist. It's not always easy. Yeah, I think we uh, touched on this several different ways, and I'm not the uh, the terms don't uh, really concern me. But a proposal was I've heard once was um, why not uh, leave the refugees there, divide the place up again like it has historically, and uh, you know, uh, like the the Kurds are uh, not liked by the other two sides. They basically have a country now, establish the you know split it up using not our, not only our uh, strengths, but uh, their strengths, mm -hmm. to help them uh, establish a caliphate and let them, you know, blend in there and solve the refugee problem uh, rather than, you know, move them to a place they're not going to be happy with. So just that general idea, just interesting to get your concept on that. Uh. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not so sure we want to be in the business of advocating an Islamic caliphate. Um, that would make me a little uneasy. Um, but the idea of actually, you know, less centralized control and giving people more autonomy is something that's not new. I mean, Vice President Biden, well before he was vice president, was advocating a partition in Iraq. Um, a lot of folks take a look at Syria, go, even if you don't like it, the effective reality on the ground is a partitioned country, so we ought to come to grips with that. But ultimately, I, I do think it's, I mean, this is, this is a question of identity, and I can't provide that answer for you. If you still feel like you're Syrian and you want to go back and build that Syria, that's up to you. I mean, so I can't tell you that you're more Sunni than you are Alawite, that you're more Syrian than you are Alawite. So I think the people just need to have, you know, some ability to make choices for themselves. And given those socioeconomic challenges, guess what? A lot of people are going to choose Germany, France, America, if they have a, if they have a choice, because I mean that's where they see they can have a better future, and that's what most of the refugees' families want, right? I just want a better future for myself and my kids, and they will go wherever they think that better future is. And right now, it's certainly not in Syria. All right, we have time for two more questions. So I have a gentleman here. And then we'll come up front. Uh, assuming we were to eradicate ISIL next month, admittedly an unlikely hypothetical, to what extent do you think this just fuels a resurgence of Al-Qaeda, who, while perhaps less graphically gory than, uh, than, than ISIL, arguably represents a greater threat to the United States? Yeah, well, the, you know, a lot of the competitive violence between the two has actually been spurred by this competition, right? It's actually compelled Al-Qaeda in some cases to take more aggressive action 
than they otherwise would too. So this is, they're competing for influence. Um, if ISIL was wiped off the face of the map tomorrow, I think a lot would depend on how, how that was done. Again, I think if it collapses of its own weight, if the locals under their domination decided we're tired of this, we're not putting up with it, you're gone, and they did it on their own, that would not be a phenomenal boost to Al-Qaeda. But if we go in, and we're the ones who eradicate ISIL militarily, all the attendant collateral damage, civilian equivalents, then I think that probably bolsters Al-Qaeda's narrative, right? That, that we're just constantly keeping any Muslim Islamic group down. And so this is a war against Islam, and that would draw people to their cause. So how it happens matters, I think. That was a very good presentation. Thank you. Uh, I don't want 300 people leaving here without commenting on the concern about refugees landing at airports. There was an article in the Harrisburg paper when that came up about the possibility of it being at Harrisburg International Airport, and the concern was dismissed as unfounded. What I do, and what I hope we want to do, is I go to a website, whether it's Snopes or a fact check or whatever, because that email was sent to me by a person with a concern, and I immediately checked it and found that it was unfounded. I had a colleague, I'm a political consultant, years ago, who was very high in one of the, I won't say which, left or right wing political groups. And I asked him why he left it. And at his high level, he was writing fundraising letters. He said, I got tired of writing letters saying someone's about to set a bomb off under your table. Remember that these groups that send out this information have to sustain themselves. They have to pay those letter writers. They have to pay for the mail they send out. How do they do that? By asking for contributions. How do they get the contributions? By getting you all riled up. I'm not saying whether anybody's right or wrong, I'm just saying have that caution. Another thing is I deal every question, day. Question, do you have a question? <coughs> yes, I do. Let's hear it. I work with people in many of the countries that we discussed today of student age. And you know what they're thinking about? They're thinking about their chemistry or physics assignments. And so we should remember that there is everyday life still going on in these countries. And to my question, when we went into Iraq, and I'm not picking sides again, but the vice president at the time said, we will be greeted as liberators and this war will be paid for with Iraqi oil. Now, my concern today, sir, is that your, your strategic analysis is very good. We still come down to tactical matters and the possibility that we can make gross errors of judgment about these people if we don't understand them better. Could you comment on that? Well, I think historically, I mean, this was this was uh, McNamara's self-critique coming out of Vietnam, is we, we get into things and we really don't have a deep appreciation for the history, culture, and traditions, and that's a big risk. We don't understand the Middle East um, necessarily like we should. Um, the only thing I'll say, I mean, I was, I was on Cheney's staff, you know, at the time. I mean, and, and um, foreign occupations always have a very short shelf life of being welcomed. Very quickly, you turn from a liberating force to a foreign occupying force, and that's just the nature of the beast. But as I mean, as folks debate this, I mean, there's there are definite costs to action. 
but there are admittedly also costs to inaction. And so that's the, that's the debate, and that's why I think it's so important to kind of have an objective sense of what the risk of terrorism is. But somehow the president's in the business not only a policy making and doing that rational strategy formulation, but somehow he's got to address at the same time concerns of the American public that do visibly feel vulnerable. Um, and, and that's not my job, that's a politician's job, um, but it's a, it's a tough one. And someone striking that balance is, is really phenomenally difficult. On behalf of the group, I'd like to present you with a small token of our appreciation for your time, effort, and sharing your knowledge with us today. So thank you very much. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it. It's a great opportunity. Thank you. Appreciate it.